So good morning, everyone. My name's Steve Lester. I'm the science director with CHEJ. And um, welcome to our training session for February. We have a very special guest today. Um, before we get to introducing Ken and, uh, and our moderator, I want to just say a few things about logistics and, and CHEJ. For those of you who may not be familiar with CHEJ, uh, we provide organizing and technical support to grassroots groups nationwide. Uh, we were founded in 1981 by Lois Gibbs, the uh, woman who organized the community at Love Canal in Niagara Falls, New York. And so um, we're, 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 I'm excited to, to be part of today's session. Um, here's how we're gonna uh, run the session today. Um, it's going to be mostly a, a conversation with our guest speaker, Ken Grossinger. Um, and I'm gonna introduce first um, the moderator who is Ken, uh, Greg Colin. Um, and we're gonna go through the presentation and I, uh, and then if there, hopefully there'll be a little time at the end for you folks to ask questions. Um, and uh, so we'll wrap up at one o'clock. So first, let me introduce Greg. Uh, Greg Colin is, will be moderating and asking questions of our guest speaker. Um, Greg uh, is uh, CHEJ's social media and website con content person, <laughs> if I can get that right. Uh, Greg is a graduate of the Art Institute of Washington. He's been with us since 2008, started as an intern and has gr grown to be a key part of our, our, uh, our, uh, our work in terms of our content and our media and our, and our communications. Uh, uh, Greg has been a, a, a huge piece of our, our growth and development over the years. Um, he, uh, he's put together our website. He's done uh, so much graphics for us for his campaigns over the years and for uh, our guidebooks and publications. Our, you know, he's, he's, he's helped create what we call our Backyard Monthly publication and our EJ Minute podcast. And I could go on and on. So it's really great to have Greg engaged and involved with us. Um, he is a true artist. And when he read, uh, when the book uh, Artworks came out, when Ken's book came out, Greg read it immediately, was had so many good things to say about it. He was really charged out. It. And so when we talked why about why we like him. <laughs> yes. And when when we talked about doing this, he said, Oh man, can I be a part of it? And of course, this is what we're doing. And of course he is. So uh with that said, now let me turn to our 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 guest speaker. And I again I'm really excited to be a part of today. Uh I have known Ken as a colleague and friend really for over 20 years. Uh, when we first met, I think he was with the AFL-CIO and involved in uh, all kinds of social justice work and economic justice work with the uh, with the unions at that time. And he became a, a member of our board for CHJ for, I, I would say, 15 years or so. And he's been a, an ally, an advisor, a, a friend. Um, uh, I really, uh, I was excited when he took this project on and uh, I can't say enough about uh, how this fits into the work. And I think what he's going to bring to us today is just a little different way of organizing and different tools one can use. I mean, we always talk about the science and the organizing as tools. Well, so can art be uh, in a different kind of context and a different way. But uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce our, our guest speaker, Ken Grossinger. And uh, welcome, Ken. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you, Greg. And Thank you, Hunter, who's behind the scenes moving the slides, and to Sharon uh, Franklin, who makes the trains run at CHEJ. Um, the work CHEJ has done, as long as I've known them, has been path-breaking, path-finding, and just central to the issues um, that we all care about on this call. Uh, it's unclear to me what the environmental justice movement would look like without Lois Gibbs, Stephen Lester, and so many other people, and your own leadership at the grassroots. So uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I've spoken at a lot of different places, and my place that I like to speak most is to people who are actually doing the work, because you have the capacity to 
uh, take these ideas and run with them. Some of you are already doing that, and hopefully we'll be able to introduce others of you to them. So thank you, Stephen. So Greg, the, the floor is now yours. All right. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Ken. Um, pleased to be a part of this conversation. Um, as a designer and an artist myself, sometimes I feel like I can be a little bit far away from the actual organizers and people doing the work in the field. So this is really just an amazing work. And I want to start out by asking Ken, um, if you could please give us an overview of the book and how your experiences as an activist inform the contents of artworks. So the book focuses on not just art and not just politics, but the impact of collaboration between artists and organizers as seen through the lens of the civil rights and Black Lives Matter movement and the environmental and immigrant justice movements. It also um, takes a look at two institutions, uh, foundations and museums, and the extent to which they support or disrupt social change strategies. Um, and I came to this uh, because, uh, as Stephen mentioned, I've been in organizing most of my life, um, 35 years or so. And when I learned my craft, when I learned how to think about organizing, art and culture were never a part of what I learned. And so when I practiced it, it obviously wasn't part of what I did. And when I started teaching younger organizers how to think strategically about their work, I didn't teach it. And then I married an artist. And um, I learned just how big a boat I met, I missed. And um, so with my wife, Micheline, um, we started something called the Cross Currents Foundation, which funds at the intersection of art and social justice. And I learned something else through that. And what I learned was that it was not just organizers that didn't think strategically about art and culture, but it was artists who didn't think strategically about their work in the service of social movements. Um, both spheres, artists and organizers do that, but many don't. And it's not happening on the scale that I think it needs to happen on. And so uh, the book is an attempt to look at what's worked and why it's worked in an area that organizers don't have that much experience in. That's amazing. And to think that, you know, a lot of this history goes back before the modern day where we think of, you know, how fast information and so forth spreads um, through social media when we're talking activism and visuals. Um, this sort of just really brought it together, how there's this foundation of when you say you're talking to the younger generation and trying to get them to understand um, how profound that is. Um, before, you know, a lot of the modern ways we have to communicate today. So with that said, um, could you please give us a couple of examples, one historical and one contemporary um, that highlight the role of art in activism? So the main point that I want to make here is that art is not just a reflection of or a reaction to social conditions, but a contributor to social change. And I wanted to look at this through an historical and a contemporary lens. So thank you for that, uh, setting that up. Um, this is an image uh, in 1963 taken by a photographer named Danny Lyon. And I should back up and say that when I talk about art, when I talk about it today, I'll be talking about art writ large. Photographs, public monuments, uh, public murals, visual, theater, music, all forms of art uh, mm -hmm. and how they intersect with politics. Uh, and so um, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was one of the first civil rights organizations to embrace art and culture. It was really a part of their DNA. Um, and at that time in the early 60s, there was a stream of white activists that were going south to work with SNCC. Uh, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and with other civil rights organizations. And one of them happened to be a self-taught photographer, a 20-year-old guy named Danny Lyon, who now lives in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And James Foreman, 
the head of SNCC realized that in order to expose the brutality of white supremacy in the South, he needed incontestable visual evidence. And so a photographer offered him that. Um, and he said to Danny Lyon, I want you to go to find these girls. So who are these girls? These are 33 teenage girls that were swept up uh, at a movie theater for protesting racial segregation and hauled to Leesburg and put in a stockade for 45 days without being charged. Their parents didn't know where they were. Their communities and allies didn't know where they were. And James said to Danny, you need to find these girls and photograph them so that we can get word out about what's going on. And so sure enough, along with two civil rights workers, uh, Danny Lyon found them, the two civil rights workers kind of uh, uh, diverted the attention of the guards and Danny through broken glass and bars took photos of these girls uh, and brought them back to um, James Foreman who immediately sent them out to the press. Uh, that led to Senator Harrison who at that time was a Senator from Pennsylvania entering this photo into the congressional record and that led to the attorney general of the time, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, to demand that these girls get swiftly released. And so the notion, again, was that art was not just a reflection of social conditions, but it was a contributor to social change. And that's just one uh, example from one art genre. So with that said, that's really powerful because, you know, as you said, it's, it's you know, it's a contributor. It's evidence, it's visual evidence. Um, there is art that we create at times, but then there's often art that captures what is real. It captures what's there. And um, I think it's it's important, you know, sort of how you open that where you said, you know, we're talking all forms of art here. So whether it's photography, whether it's, um, you know, medium on canvas or whatnot, it all plays its part. And I think um, for for creatives, it is important to understand that it's important to understand the the power that is that is held, no matter what your medium of art uh, of, of art is. And that image was particularly powerful. Thank you. So the next medium I want to talk about are murals, uh, and this is a contemporary story from 2013. Uh, there was an artist named Justin Nethercut, street name Nether, who entered into a collaboration with a housing organizer. Um, in Baltimore, and those of you that know Baltimore, and for those of you who don't, uh, Baltimore is one of the last of the East Coast cities that have blocks and blocks and blocks of dilapidated housing. And Justin wanted to call attention um, to the housing and approach Micheline and I uh, for funds from the Cross Currents Foundation, since we were funding this kind of stuff, uh, for this project. Uh, and I am not a diplomat, but I said in my most diplomatic tone, this is great, but I'm not sure what, that it's going to do anything. I'm not sure it's going to change anything. You can draw some attention to it, but what's going to be the change element of this? And he says, yeah, but. And the yeah, but was the work of the housing organizer, Carol Ott who happened to be a Republican woman. Uh, and what Carol did is research who owned these buildings. And so when you look at this Raven, which is the name of the, ball, of the football team in Baltimore, the Baltimore Ravens, and that's their colors, uh, you also see a QR code next to its beak. And when you scan the QR code, it took you to a website and up popped the name of the slumlord who owned the building. <laughs> and so Channel 2 called this art aimed to shame. And um, here's what happened. So uh, it was up for two days. Uh, and um, in the third day, the QR code was ripped down, although the mural was left intact. So no surprise there. So Justin being Justin and the housing organizer being the housing organizer, they went up and popped up that QR code. Uh, and it uh, uh, and, and so it held. And I don't know if anyone knows how long it takes to get a demolition and renovation license. 
um, in Baltimore. I don't even know what it takes in Washington, D.C., but that building came down in two to three weeks. And so Justin made 15 of these. And every time he put up another one, another landlord or slumlord got irate, more press followed. And I want to zone in on the fifth mural that went up. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide of it. But the fifth mural was a painting of Pharaoh wearing a golden headdress. And instead of looking out over Egypt, Pharaoh was looking out over a cotton plantation. And the words exile were written in Hebrew and English. And the slum lord went ballistic when the QR code went up. And he calls the daily newspaper, which is the Baltimore Sun, and says, here's what I've got to say about this. Number one, this is hate speech. This is the idea of Jews keeping down blacks in the ghetto because he happened to be Jewish. And number two, I don't own this building. And so the Baltimore Sun uh, assigned three reporters to the story. It was a page and a half hatchet job on the entire project. So now sort of everybody knew about the project. And the Baltimore Weekly, which was the weekly progressive alternative to the Daily, calls up Justin for comment and then asks Justin if it's okay with him if he calls up the reporters to ask a question that you might imagine he would ask, which is, did he just report this story or did he research it before he wrote it? Or they, actually, there were three of them. Uh, and in fact, the Baltimore Weekly did its own independent research and found out that the slumlord had been cited 500 times for lead paint in other units that he had and he did, in fact, have controlling authority of the building. So now you've got a volley going on because the Baltimore Weekly is taking on the Baltimore Daily. And every time a new mural goes up, there's more press, blogs and podcasts and radio and TV and newspapers. And by the end of the summer, the mayor threw up her hands and said, I've had enough of this. And she increased the demolition a uh, budget by over $20 million, which for Baltimore, a relatively small city, is not an insignificant amount of money. And so again, it was the idea of a collaboration between artists and organizers and the impact of that collaboration demonstrating that art is not just a reflection of social conditions or a reaction to them, but a contributor to social change. That's um that's a powerful story, especially behind um how you know you had this domino effect that you know with the first mural showing up and then action happening after that. Like you said, not just a reaction, but something that is literally causing action. Um, can you please share with us what you learned, uh, what you discovered about the power of artist activists in their work to change narratives? Yeah. So, point number two in the book is that we know as organizers, activists, lobbyists, advocates, uh, progressives, we know that sometimes uh, our work leads to social change. But what often happens is our victories get rolled back when power changes hands. Uh, so think about Obama's um, Obamacare. Uh, we passed that and the Republicans spent the next X number of years trying to repeal it. Uh, now, that's one example where they didn't win, but oftentimes these things get rolled back. And so narrative power is a term that artists are beginning to use more and more, which is the sense of taking control of our stories, of our people, of our places and how they're defined. Hank Willis Thomas, a photographer uh, based in Brooklyn in New York, said that uh, a change on his timeline was 10, 20 30 and 40 years. Uh, and, and that's because he was trying to change the narrative. He was trying to get at shifting cultural perspectives. And so these next two slides are, are meant to illustrate that. Uh, this is a picture of a baby called Kikito. Um, in the height of the Trump administration, I think 2017, um, 
when Trump was trying to define Mexicans in vile terms and dehumanize and demonize them. Uh, J.R., who's a French photographer and muralist, he puts up murals all over the world, uh, came to the U.S.-Mexico border uh, and went to a town called Tecat. Tecat is a very, very, very small community. Uh, and he met with the people who lived in Tecat. Uh, and in one of the homes, there was a picture, there was a baby who was one year old in its crib while he was talking to the mother. And he asked the mother if it was okay uh, if he took a picture of the baby. And then he asked the mother one more thing. Would you mind if I blew up your baby's face and put it on a mural? And so what you're looking at is a 70 foot high uh, picture of a one year old baby propped up by plywood and scaffolding, looking out seemingly over the US-Mexico border wall with two ICE agents looking up at it. So JR posts this image and within 24 hours, it's seen by a million people. And all of a sudden, people from all over the world start traveling down to Tecat, Mexico, which is just the other side of the US-Mexico border, uh, to see this image. And so on the one hand, you've got Trump trying to demonize Mexicans. And on the other hand, you've got a humanitarian image uh, that people are looking at. And it's that kind of narrative uh, or effort to influence the narratives and how people think about that's at the core of the notion of narrative power. This one image in and of itself isn't gonna change anything, but multiple types of art forms, which penetrates popular culture in a way that organizers think never will, may get us there. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, and this is an altogether different example with an altogether different form of art, uh, and that is public monuments. You know that public monuments became central targets during the Black Lives Matter movement for obvious reasons. They're mostly white supremacists that are being honored, uh, usually at 16 feet, um, on monuments that are hewn in stone and um, steel. So they're permanent structures. And when you walk by them, uh, you're basically looking up at a white supremacist. And so this is a monument that an artist named Kehinde Wiley made. Uh, and what Kehinde did was to pull down the white Confederate general that's sitting on the horseback and replace it with a black horseman wearing dreadlocks and in sneakers. So now, if you're a little kid looking up at a monument, you're looking up as, a, as someone to look up to as a hero, instead of being looked down upon by a supremacist. It's another effort uh, to try to shift the narrative, to try to shift, uh, you know, Kendi Wiley basically subverted this image uh, and used it to lift our work up. That's um that's a like, powerful alteration of um you know what we what we're thinking of here we're we're looking at how activists are able to use um, their various mediums of art and in that in that example with the statue um, the state is is well versed at using the using art to create culture to create feelings to create uh, symbolism so just knowing that you know the state knows how powerful visuals are. Um, it's great to see that activists know just as well. And just like with the previous piece, um, Kikito, um, you know, a, a child behind a fence and then the, the ICE agents, you know, just as powerful because one day, you know, the, the innocent children that are caught up in this are, are going to be adults. And we think about adults differently than we think about children. So um, I find it all really thought provoking. Um, so... With all these pieces that have been created, um, preservation is also important as well. So um, it's important that museums, they're finally waking up to how they can be a home for social change and education and how they inspire community activism. How do you think the relationship between, uh, how do you think of the relationship between museums and activism? So I think that museums will become community action targets if they don't respond to the current times. 
but they could become community building institutions. Uh, museums are one of the most trusted institutions in America. When you walk into a museum and you go to the Museum of Natural History in New York City and you look at an exhibit, you're basically saying to yourself, oh, wow, that's how it happened. You don't question the narrative coming out of the museum. So museums are really important institutions to ally with when it's possible. And so I wanted to share uh, a couple of stories about the community action target component uh, and the community building component. Uh, this is an image uh, of a die-in uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. There's a photographer named Nan Golden. Uh, there was recently a movie made about her. Some of you may have seen it. Um, and Nan Golden was addicted to Oxycontin. She was a victim of the opioid crisis. And um, she wanted to fight. She wanted to do something after she, she her addiction ended. Um, and it was the Sackler family, as most of you know, uh, that was funding the creation of Oxycontin. Well, the Sackler family has been art washing its reputation all over the world. I mean, in galleries, on donor walls, in the Tate Modern in London, there's even a Sackler elevator with a marker. Um, they're looking to get their name out and looking to burnish their images as people that do good. And so what Nan Golden did was to organize as other artists to demand that cultural institutions literally around the world pull down Sackler's name. Uh, and those that don't, uh, have become community action targets. Uh, a number did, a number of significant museums have, uh, and but the fight continues. And so it's one way in which community action um, or action that we take uh, from the community uh, against museums will take place uh, if uh, museums are not responsive. But I wanna talk more importantly about what is working with museums because it holds out the promise of a relationship between organizing uh, and, and the resources that a museum can bring to the table. This is an image of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Uh, it's in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, uh, it was created by an organization called the Equal Justice Initiative started by Brian Stevenson. Uh, and this, um, Memorial is about a quarter of a mile from a museum called the Legacy Museum. And what you're looking at is a, 800, a subset of 805 Horton steel beams hanging from a ceiling. And this rectangle, which can be imagined to be a coffin, uh, in it are the names of people who had been lynched and the counties in which the lynching took place. So if you're an activist from Richmond, Virginia, and you see the name of one of your ancestors on this um, steel beam, what you can do is get a life-size replica of this and bring it back to Richmond. And you can demand that the city acknowledge that lynching took place and who it was that they lynched and it could be used for other kinds of social justice fight. This was something called the Remembrance Project that the National Memorial for Peace and Justice did. And it's a way that Brian Stephen understood that it wasn't enough just to represent what happened, but how do we use that representation in the service of our social work? Uh, and um, let's go on to the next slide. This is also a, a very powerful example of a community being involved uh, in a museum. Uh, when uh, Breonna Taylor was killed, ta Coates commissioned an artist named Amy Sherald. Amy was the person who did Michelle Obama's portrait, who's in the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, and he asked her if she would do a, a portrait of Breonna Taylor. And Amy Sherald said yes, but she wanted it shown in Louisville which is where Brianna Taylor was killed. Uh, and so um, the Speed Museum 
which is the largest and oldest cultural institution in Kentucky, uh, in Louisville, started asking itself what it meant to be a museum in the time of Black Lives Matter. And the director, a guy named Stephen Riley, decided that he would empty several of his galleries in the museum uh, and do a Black Lives Matter exhibition. And what was important about the exhibition was that he created two community advisory boards. One was a national board, wasn't a community advisory board, it was a national advisory board made up of artists who had family members killed or maimed by the police. And the other was a local community advisory board made up of mental health workers, legal advocates, um, social workers, a various kind of range of organizations and folks in Louisville. And the National Advisory Board and the local advisory board didn't always see it eye to eye. The National Advisory Board said, we need 30 images that reflect Black Lives Matter. The local advisory board said, okay, but all the artists have to be Black. And so there was a series of issues that came up in the discussion. And the importance of this discussion is that the curator wasn't yet involved. The curator's work was informed by the discussions between the national and local community advisory boards. And so that flipped the switch. Uh, and Sadiqa Reynolds, who at that time was the CEO of the Louisville Urban League said, it was the first time my community felt comfortable going into the museum. And so it's now become really in earnest, a community building institution where the Urban League and any number of other organizations hold, hold meetings and um, do and are allied with. So it, uh, it's it's a great example uh, and holds out a lot of promise for us. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, one thing that's really important in all of that is that um, the museums, they also have to stand for truth. And then there's a big, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion and, and, and debate that goes on behind that, you know, whether people are 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 in agreement. Uh, if, is this the truth? And then later on, as you had gotten to the, uh, the boards uh, later on having their discussions, the people who are able to contribute to the truth uh, and having the different perspectives can put people more at ease. Um, so those are all important parts as well. Um, so in the book, you talk about how foundations are also waking up, and I quote, investments in climate justice organizations, for instance, are driven partially by move, uh, movement organizations telling them that the arts are a critical component of what is needed to help tell the story. How is philanthropy changing and do you think it's working? It's important to recognize that philanthropy, cultural philanthropy in particular, has a very troubled past. Um, cultural philanthropy was basically white male philanthropists that built elite art institutions and showed white painters. That's where it got its start. So there's a host of issues related to race, class, gender, and identity that are embedded in the history of philanthropy. Um, we're beginning to see that change now, not on scale, but I wanted to share uh, one example of where it is changing because it offers the promise of what could be. Uh, this is a, a painting by Roy Lichtenstein that he did in the early 60s called The Masterpiece. And uh, the chair of the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York City, bought this from Roy and befriended Roy and his wife, Dorothy, uh, and put this on her mantle uh, in New York above her fireplace. Uh, and then she did a few more things. If you fast forward to today, uh, among them was she saw Ava DuVernay's film, The 13th, which talks about, in part, the Atlantic slave trade and how that brings us right up to mass incarceration. And she read Brian Stevens' book, Just Mercy, talks about mass incarceration. And she's so moved by the film, she calls up Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, and says, Darren, we need to do something to end mass incarceration. What are we going to do? 
Uh, and so Darren convenes a meeting that includes Brian Stevenson, uh, Elizabeth Alexander, who is the head of the Mellon Foundation, and a number of others to, to talk about it. And Agnes Gunn, the um, woman who owned the picture, uh, said, I have an idea. What if we sold it and used the money uh, to fund cultural strategies to end mass incarceration? And so she calls up Dorothy Lichtenstein and says, Dorothy, how would you feel if I sell, sold Roy's painting? And Dorothy was excited that the money would be used well. And she put it on the market and uh, it, it went for $160 million. And 100 million of that 160 was used to create something called the Art for Justice Fund to support cultural strategies for social change around mass incarceration. And one of the things that was important about this is that 30% or 50%, I forget the number now, of the funds actually went to families of those who were incarcerated and to the incarcerated themselves. But they also created a network so that their grant giving could be informed by people that were closest to the issue on the ground. That is to say, people who are incarcerated and their families. So philanthropy took a leap from being totally disconnected um, and being driven internally by staff and directors and boards to um, an entity which is now engaged more fully in the community. And we see this happening in a lot of different places. The um, Pop Culture Collaborative, uh, the uh, Perspective Fund, any number of foundations are beginning to do this. Again, I don't want to overstate it because it's not a lot, but it's a direction and it's an important direction. And it means that organizers, that's you, need to continue to put pressure on funders and say, where is our funds for cultural organizing? Because culture has the capacity to penetrate popular culture in a way that organizing never will. That's um, pretty profound and important. And I have always taken an interest in the avenues that are available for some of these um, uh, fundraising, uh, say the tools that are available to fundraise. And just like you know, a, a piece of art can be sold to fund, um, you know, to fund uh, those who have been incarcerated and so forth. Um, so many things in new media exist today that allow people to create visuals and have their own version of, let me put this out here and then contribute to a good cause because of it. So I, I can really appreciate seeing the way that um, that philanthropy has, has shifted um, and it has opened up more. Um, so now I'm very interested in how culture has altered and brought to the foreground women's issues. In the book, you talk about film, in particular, Nine to Five with Jane Fonda, who I know you discuss the book with. Um, can you tell us about this and what Fonda did surrounding the film to increase awareness? Yeah, and I'll say that I'll, I'll cut off the presentation after this one because I just looked at the time and I saw we only have about 15 minutes left for Q&A and discussion. So, but I do want to talk about this. Um, the third chapter of my book talks about the power of film in political mobilization. And it starts out contrasting two of Jane Fonda films. It doesn't start out looking at docs, uh, which is what we typically are drawn to for social change. It starts out looking at two narrative films. Uh, one is The China Syndrome and one is Nine to Five. The China Syndrome, you'll remember, is with um, Jack Lemmon, Michael Douglas, Jane Fonda, uh, uh, Peter Dreyfus or Richard Dreyfus. Um, and it's um, a story uh, where uh, Jane Fonda and Michael Douglas are news people uh, and they go to a nuclear generating station uh, that's on the verge of a nuclear meltdown. And the story in the film basically asks the question about whether it's possible Look, my dog wants a piece of the action too. Sorry for the distraction here. Uh, whether it's possible for an, uh, a nuclear energy industry 
to be safe and at the same time profitable. So it wasn't tied kind of any anti-nuclear movement, but it did help lift consciousness in part because 10 days after the film came out, TMI happened, Three Mile Island, which was the largest release of radiation in US history, five on a seven point Richter scale. Uh, and so now this film had nine times the box office receipts in, uh, relative to the production costs of the film. And it was out there in a very big way. Ted Turner would say it was this film that turned him against nuclear power. But because it wasn't tied to any kind of organizing in the anti-nuclear movement, it stopped. It had an important value as all art does. It lifted up new ideas for people to think about, but it didn't move things forward beyond that. And so I contrast it with nine to five. That's the film with Dolly Parton, Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda. Uh, it, it's a film about women demanding equity in the workplace. And uh, there was an organization called Nine to Five, Nine to Five, the organization, not the film, uh, which was an organization of working women. And after the Vietnam War wound down, Jane called up one of the co-founders of Nine to Five, a woman named Karen Nussbaum and said to Karen that she wanted to learn about uh, what the organization was doing and what women were experiencing in the workplace at that time. And so in addition to small group meetings, they did a few large ones. And in Ohio, there was a large group meeting uh, and towards the end of the night, Jane just had like a throwaway line, which was, do any of you ever have revenge fantasies about your boss? And the place lit up. Um, one woman stood up and said, I want to grind his bones into coffee beans and feed them to the other managers. And at that moment, Jane knew that the film needed not to be a drama because she was afraid it was going to be tagged as a feminist film and not seen, but a comedy. Mm -hmm. And so nine to five, the organization and Jane and her folks that made the film came together for a 20 city tour with the film and speaking. And this is her speaking in San Francisco. Um, and that tour doubled the number of chapters that nine to five had organized. So it's again, it's a way that another art form actually contributed to social change and to the organization of it in collaboration with organizers. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, Greg, I think I'll wind down to see if there are any comments people want to make. All right. Amazing, amazing. I'm putting the link to your book in the chat. Hey, Greg, do you have any other comments or thoughts at this right moment? Um, so actually, uh, actually, we we may have a. I see a hand up, a um, couple of hands up. Uh, I'll, I'll let them go first. I'll, I'll close out. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have a few people with their hands up. Lee, why don't you go first? Just identify yourself if you would. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm an award environmentalist activist and a playwright. And it's really been hard uh, with a film of mine, Dreams from a Planet in Peril, which is uh, had commendations and some of it premiered at the Chelsea Film Festival. It's really been hard to hook that film up, which um, reveals with four different dreams in different styles, uh, the um, why there is planetary abuse. Um, it's really been hard to hook up with any type of distribution or with an organization. The organizations we've queried have been really, really cautious, whether it's the Sierra Club, um, because the film is quite radical and very anti-corporate. And so my question to you is, how do you hook up with an organization that might give you some support and might give you some funding and distribution? And um, that's one question. The other is um, similar for, for a play of mine, which addresses uh, uh, white supremacy, um, trying to find 
uh, funding to bring that to a workshop production when you don't have any power or or huge connections um, and then hook it up to an organization uh, through which discussion might be had like um, stand up to Jewish hate, what have you. Um, it's really difficult. So if you have any advice, <laughs> help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, that's sort of an hour long discussion <laughs> to understand more deeply uh, where both things are going. Uh, I would just say that there are, in terms of your film, uh, organizations that are progressive uh, and are set up specifically, and you probably know them, Doc Society. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They started a program called Good Pitch. Uh, and what they did is they brought in eight filmmakers representing eight different films uh, to tell a story to stakeholders. And in the audience was two or 300 funders. And so people got exposure to the film and that organization has raised $50 million since they started, all of which has gone to filmmakers, not for administration or the organization of the work. Uh, and so there are organizations like that. Uh, there's also another organization based in New York City, uh, but I'm, I'm blanking on the full name of it, but it's specifically for women filmmakers. Um, and uh, maybe um, I'll get you the actual name if you don't already know them and send it on to Greg or Steven so that they can forward it to you. So there are places to go, but you're absolutely right. Raising money is in, in an impossible. Uh, you know, films are, are, are so deep. The hole that you have to go down is so deep because of their expense that it's very, very difficult. And a lot of filmmakers use wind up using their own funds in the hope of building support for the idea and then generating income from executive producers, foundations, and production companies. Uh, and so I, I can't go into any more detail than that now, uh, but that's what I would suggest uh, on the film front. I'm less familiar with uh, funding for theater, um, though I do think that organizations like the Mellon Foundation uh, and the Ford Foundation um, and the Kenneth Rainin Foundation, there are a lot of funders which focus on social justice and white supremacy right now. The time is good. Um, may I also yeah. add a suggestion? Um, this is just new, new media. I'm not sure if you've um, taken a look at something like kickstarter.com. It's very good for uh, laying out a public plan for a creative project like film and then raising your money there once you, you present that plan. Mirna, let's have it here from you now. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, speaking to you from Vieques Island in Puerto Rico. And <clears throat> You lucky person. Pardon me? I said you're a lucky person being in Vegas. Oh, I certainly am. <laughs> Very grateful that this is where I am right now. And where I am, uh, I work with a group called uh, Didas Viequenses Valen. And it we work social justice, but we're also uh, facing a cleanup of one of the most toxic sites in the world after six decades of uh, being a bombing target for military exercises. Uh, the, the situation of health, the situation of environment, the situation of the sea, the situation of our controlled airspace, all of these things still exist. Although we got the Navy out uh, or had them close the base and stop the bombing. However, we have a lot of problems going here in paradise, this beautiful little island. And uh, one of our main projects now is opening a graphic studio so that uh, we can get our plight, uh, however we work it on posters, silk screen work, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, 
I, I ordered your book, but I don't know if your book has any uh, illustrations. I couldn't find that. Are the, uh, the works that you showed today, uh, are they in the book? Art yes, works? they are. Yeah, there's about 26 images, all of the ones I showed today and others. Well, that's great to know. Thank you. Uh, to use as uh, this is very inspirational, you know, and and uh, we're really just getting this started, but we've got an excellent graphic graphic artist coming to Vieques to do workshops with us, yeah, and uh, to get this off the ground. I would appreciate it if you could direct me uh, to some work specifically with posters and uh, silk screen work. Um, okay. Um, I will do that, not now. Yes. Uh, um, but um, I'll send a note again to somebody, Stephen, Sharon, Greg, whoever's going to do it. Uh, with some uh, options. I, I would say that, you know, when I did an event with um, a union, the Service Employees International Union uh, in December, uh, and they had graphic artists on the panel with me because that's what they were using to drive their organizing. So yeah. I agree with you. And of course, there's a lot of historical precedent. If you look at the Mexican muralists, uh, 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 Diego Rivera and so and Sequeres and Orozco. I mean, they basically told the story of the Mexican Revolution and nourished uh, sentiment toward it. Uh, and so there's a lot of history here. Uh, and it's one of the areas that labor has been good at, at in terms of uh, posters. Um, there are people, there is a center in Los Angeles that, again, I'm going to have to get you the name, that does nothing but graphic posters and sets up exhibitions with them. And they could be very useful to you. Well, you have been very useful. And uh, I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. OK. I would like to re uh, reiterate to everyone that after this call, you'll receive a follow-up email that will provide a link to the recording, the slides, and a link to Ken's book. And if any other resources you want me to share, Ken, please let me know. Here, I do have a website um which is artworksbook.com artworksbook.com and on it you'll learn more about the book um some of the people that are invested in lifting it up uh some of the reviews of the book uh and events um most of my events i did about 40 of them were last year but i'm in the process of scheduling new events in person events uh, and so if you're in a city where a presentation like this could be helpful to your organizing and you can turn people out, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about participating in that. Okay, I think we're getting ready to wrap up. We've got about two minutes left. Greg, uh, um... I could throw in a closing statement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> really appreciate you writing this book first and foremost, Ken. Um, for me, it's it's very validating, um, you know, that there is much to be done, especially on the the visual side of art that contributes to helping people into creating change. Um, now, there's so much to do with creation, preservation, persuasion, and these are not just again tools of large organizations or tools of the state. These are tools that everyday people have access to. And what excites me more and more. This book is almost like a roadmap of where we came from to where we're going, and there are even more tools today um, to which I can no longer say that I don't have the excuse to be able to, to not get it done in the way that a generation had certain struggles to overcome. Some of those are, are reminding me how much easier it is today. Uh, it just takes persistence. So thank you for that. Thank you, Greg. And thank you to everybody who uh, joined the call today. It's a uh, delight for me to be here uh, with you. I kind of feel weird to say that since this is virtual, but it does feel that way. <laughs> and uh, thanks again for the great work that CHEJ does. It's, uh, it's extraordinary.
And once again, Ken, thank you for being here. Uh, it's been great. I, I, I want to encourage you all to go out and get Ken's book and to think about ways to use uh, art in your work and your activism. I want to close with just one little brief story. I, I happen to be in East Palestine, the site of that horrific train wreck for the one year anniversary uh, a little over a week ago. And uh, at the end of that, one of their events, they un unveil unveiled a banner which said, we refuse to die. And it's part of, uh, in fact, the people who organized it are actually uh, connected to Ken, they knew Ken, they, uh, so they were quite excited to be able to be there. And, and that was the image that was on the media the next day. And, and, uh, and, and it told the message of where people were coming from. Is there, you know, they're, they're struggling with what EPA tells them, which is everything is fine and their reality, which they know is not. And so it was another example of, of where uh, art became uh, more than just uh, the medium. It was also the message. So thank you again, Ken. Uh, thank you all for being here. We'll continue our series uh, at one month where we'll be talking about strategic uh, planning. And we have a guest speaker from the Blue Ridge Environmental uh, Defense League who will be doing that, a guy named Lou Zeller, some of you may know. So thank you again uh, for coming. Uh, we will, as Hunter mentioned, send you the recording, the slides, and uh, if you have follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you again. Mr. Lester, am I able to ask you a question now? Um, if it's really quick, but we're really officially done. People can- Okay, I, I didn't want it to be on recording necessarily, but 